Hello and welcome to Calm Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I am your host, the stuffy-nosed Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Lisa Marciano, who is a writer and Jungian analyst and a podcaster at This Jungian Life. She's also a part of various associations with a specific focus on evidence-based gender medicine. In this conversation, we speak about the intrusion of this concept of gender into the diagnostic criteria and the absence of a holistic approach to mental health that has allowed the psychological industry or institutions to succumb time and again to collective psychosis. Lisa's been on my show several times, and it's always great to speak with her. If you are interested in learning more about her various works, links to them are down there in the description. Without further ado, here is Lisa Marciano. This is a big medical scandal. You think? It's affecting a lot of families. Yes, I think. Because so, I've heard rumors. I think you've been responsible for spreading some of the rumors. Oh, no. It's all lived experience, what's coming through <laughs> me. It's just, just anecdotes, no data points. That's right. That's right. What well, should we... Um, well, we, I, we have a few things to cover. We can just start wrapping. Okay. Sure. Um, how many organizations uh, with acronyms are you involved in, and which ones would you like to speak about? Uh, well, I'm, I'm an advisor to Stegem and uh, Genspect. And, uh, Genspect isn't an acronym, though. That's just a word. No, that's true. How about ICGDR? That's another one. International Combined Gender Doctors <laughs> Review. <laughs> the International Comprehensive Gender Dysphoria Research, mm. something like that. Oh, wow. When was that founded? And that, um, that, that's Lisa Littman's Research Institute. She institutionalized herself. The, the Institute for Comprehensive Gender Dysphoria Research. That's Excellent. it. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. But, but the one I, the one, the one that uh, I want to talk about, well, the one that I'm most involved in, let's put it that way, and therefore most knowledgeable about is the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, or GETA. GETA. Mm -hmm. Gender Exploratory. Yes. Therapy. Uh, therapy. Therapy of association. And exploratory yeah. as opposed to affirmative mm -hmm. or conversionary. Yes, exactly. And I, I think that's a good way to frame it because it kind of occupies, you know, there's there's this sort of binary thinking, if you will, that uh, therapy for gender can be either um, uh, affirmative or it's conversion therapy. And, you know, that is not the case at all. Uh, in fact, it's it's so interesting because... You know, there's this problem even with calling it gender exploratory therapy, because really it's just therapy. And it's a lot of the time, it's not even really about gender. That's just kind of the identified problem that people have. But really what's going on under, underneath might be something quite different. So it feels funny to call it gender exploratory therapy, but we need to differentiate ourselves from those who are practicing in an affirmative way because the whole reason, or one of the main reasons that we set GETA up is so many patients and families are looking for therapists who will do good basic therapy. And, and I don't consider, I don't consider affirmative Therapy, therapy, actually. What would it be? Uh, if not therapy. I care, I, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, what I'm saying is, if you someone walks into a therapist's office and says, "I'm," I think of a transgender, and the therapist says, uh, "Great, let me ask you five questions. Here's your letter." 
Yeah, I don't think that's therapy. I don't know that it's care either. It might, maybe it's not practice, possibly. I was trying to steel man it with a word, you know, but if, if it is malpractice, then any uh, steel manning is uh, false yeah. advertising or covering yeah. complicit with the thing. I, I've asked, I probably have asked you this. Um, I know I've asked Sasha and Stella this, but it's, mm -hmm. a good, uh, it's a good kind of framework establishing question about the emergence of gender therapy, because mm -hmm. I hear from from kids or young adults and i hear from parents they're like oh this this gender thing is this thing so let's go find a gender yeah, therapist yeah. yeah 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 right so it it seems like it was the market just kind of opened up it did it did you know there is a really good uh kind of body of evidence that supports the use of therapy and and i'm going to talk specifically about what's called psychodynamic therapy which basically means I mean, they're different orientations, right? The therapists have, if you're a psychodynamic therapist, you think that some things that we do are unconscious and that part of the motivation for seeking therapy or part of what you're going to do in therapy is explore that which is unconscious and maybe even make it conscious, or at least some of it. Um, and, and for this kind of therapy, which is, you know, over a hundred years old at this point, there's actually really good evidence base for it that it works with a range of different distress. So it's kind of a trans diagnostic treatment. If you have depression, if you have anxiety, if you have um, uh, any number of other issues, you can seek out a psychodynamic therapist and there's a pretty good chance that you will be helped by it to some extent. And again, there's, there's, there's good research on that at this point. So the idea that we would have this kind of micro specialty called gender therapy, and that it would be something that's very specific. It's a little, it's a little new. I mean, I will say, of course, there are psychodynamic psychotherapists who have an expertise in eating disorders. And if I had a kid with an eating disorder, I would want to seek out one of those therapists, but we don't have something called eating disorder therapy. No, no, but just we don't. or eating disorder clinic. Sure, and there there are certainly different treatment modalities, but it sort of starts off with the same, uh, you know, it's the same um, general training, mm. and then someone might get additional training or experience in it, but it isn't considered to be its own form of therapy. Mm -hmm. But it would make sense that that would be more of a form of therapy than gender because an eating disorder has material evidence to it. Like somebody's relationship to the act of eating is different than somebody's relationship to this thing called gender identity. Absolutely. I don't, I don't disagree with you there at all. But I think what I'm saying is that um, therapy in general uh, is, can treat all different kinds of issues mm -hmm. that have to do with psychological distress or say with um, difficulties with the body. You know, anything that's psychological can be treated with psychological therapy. Mm -hmm. So why do we need this own, this kind of micro specialty for gender therapy? Because, well, one answer would be because there's a marketplace demand for it and there's money to be yeah. made. Yes. Or there's work yes. to be done, let's say. Yeah, I, I, I see that line of thinking and I, I don't doubt that's, that it is there. And I, and I have a slightly different take on it is mm -hmm. that as soon as we sort of think about things in this really medicalized fashion, then we have a tendency to kind of look for the answer, you know, because I mean, if you have strep throat, you want to go and you want to get the antibiotic that's going to kill that pathogen and make you better. But the, you know, the, the psyche doesn't really work like that. Hmm. But when we medicalize it, we're sort of approaching it that way. Like there's a diagnostic path mm -hmm. that's kind of more or less, uh, usually going to be similar between different 
psyches, because just like the body is similar between humans, the psyche would be assumably right. similar. I mean, so you asked what is affirmative therapy, but in a way it's very much like that strep throat model. Like if you think you have strep throat, you go to the doctor and you say, I think I have strep throat. And the doctor says, here, let me do this rapid strep test to make sure that that's what's going on. And then I can give you this script and you can go fill it and you'll get better. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same a, you know, a trans kid goes to the gender therapist and says, I think I'm transgender. And the therapist says, okay, let me, you know, send you on your way for, you know, drugs and surgeries. Now, of course, I'm being, I'm being a little bit flip. I know it probably doesn't happen always quite that quickly. Of course, the difference is there's no rapid test to see if you're trans and that these interventions will actually help you. But it's, it's almost mm. like we've been analogizing to these kind of more medicalized scenarios. Yeah. We think that all we have to do is just ascertain that this is the issue. And then that's it. Do you think part of uh, the path towards changing or steering the culture away from over affirmation or just affirmation itself would be mm -hmm. to raise more consciousness or awareness of what psychodynamic therapy is, what psychology is about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think so, but yeah. that, that would be my bias, wouldn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty uphill, uh, hmm. journey too. It, it's kind of good. But it's been around for a hundred years. You'd assume yeah. that everybody would know. Well, one of Geta's, uh, the get us tagline on our soon to be launched new and improved website is a psychological approach for psychological distress. And then you have a kid with a bunch of makeup on to kind of indicate that it's a particular, like, how do you tie <laughs> it to gender? Right. You still have to well, somehow tie it to gender, it, right. which I, I understand. It, I, I kind of actually enjoy that you're wrestling with the tension of, mm -hmm prescribing what this is about and you have to break that mold but also frame it that way in order to attract exactly well the, what we're dealing with is is uh patients who think that the issue is gender and and by the way i'm not i'm not trying i can just sort of hear people um screeching when i say oh it's not really about gender it's like, well, I believe that fully believe that that is where the distress is locating itself. Right. I, it's not, it's not like I'm saying that that's just some kind of phantom and these kids don't know what's what they're talking about. No, I really, really get that this is how the distress is presenting and that there's real distress around gender. I, I just don't know that it's, um, hmm. At bottom, it's not really different at, at its essence. It's not really different from other manifestations of human psychological distress. So distress as opposed to uh, a disorder like obsessive compulsive disorder or borderline personality disorder. Do, well, do you wrestle with even those? Uh, do you yeah, have a hard time with yeah, that kind of sure, diagnostic stuff? Sure, sure, huh. yeah. I mean, you know, the thing about virtually everything in the DSM, the DSM is pretty big at this point, so I'm, I'm trying not to, uh, I'm trying to leave a little wiggle room here because I haven't poured over it. But, but pretty much everything in that book, um, the, the symptoms are subjective, right? This is, this is the thing about mental health is that hmm. it's not like, well, do you have strep throat or the, or pneumonia or the flu? Hmm. It's, it, it's not, it's there, there isn't something that's kind of independently verifiable. If you come to me and you say I'm depressed, yeah. I have no idea what that experience is like for you. I can ask you about it. And I would, by the way, so tell me what you mean about that. Your depressed might look really different from someone else's depressed. There's no way for me to verify that you're depressed. You could absolutely just be lying to me. I don't know why you do that, but maybe you don't actually feel depressed. 
there's there's no way to 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 verify it Mm -hmm. it is an entirely subjective self-report kind of uh, experience which doesn't make it less legitimate yes but but it does it does mean that it's very very different and so um now you know obviously there there are some kind of behavioral symptoms but again they're they're um they're behavioral they're not uh it's not like it can be sort of independently verified through through some kind of blood or lab test yeah but because even behavior needs to be interpreted yes 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 and and uh so when you talk about obsessive compulsive disorder or borderline personality disorder these are these are mostly based on behaviors and do they have some kind of genetic component i mean there's enough research that we absolutely know that there is you know there's some kind you're you're more likely hmm. to have ocd if someone in your family had ocd yeah uh so you know so clearly there's a biological component but is it this really discrete thing or is that a a manifestation of some way that the person is suffering and that's how it comes out okay so So maybe you have a predisposition for it to express itself that way so in the dsm they would have the label this disorder Mm -hmm. and then they'd have what like 10 or 5 or 20 different aspects that if you have enough of these you probably have this thing so that's what you mean by Mm -hmm. subjective so somebody's interpreting you into this category well and you might even your your psyche might have interpreted you into that category if you know what i mean like yeah. as an unconscious process because i think i think a lot maybe not all but much of um how we express distress is a kind of cultural negotiation between us and you know what's out there in the culture in terms of media in terms of our experiences with doctors and therapists and the internet and (laughs) thank you and the internet so it's like we're always reaching for a story you know we're we're, we 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 we're our our mind thinks like we we think in stories we are creatures of story we are looking we're always looking for a narrative and the culture kind of provides these narratives that we can say well that looks like it fits Mm -hmm. and then that can in turn like shape actually how we feel it's not it's not like we're pretending it's not like we're putting something on it's not like we're faking it but it kind of gives us the channels through which um to express this very yes and again the distress is real I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, we're all just big fakers. Yeah. It, I I just, I'm, since we've been speaking today, I I just, it keeps on coming to my mind that before the DSM, before psychoanalysis, there was the Bible and the church Mm -hmm. and the Mm -hmm. Bible was the book you went to, or you went to a priest that would lead you to the Bible to speak about your distress and Mm -hmm. the Bible um, you know, it talks about, it, it has a story about the world and about the human being. This is what a man is. This is what a woman is. This is what nature is. This is what God is. Right. And, it, and, and in those relationships, there's wisdoms or, or expectations, behaviors, uh, you know, kind of dictates mm-hmm. on what you should do or to how to interpret your experience. Um, which in our modern way of thinking, we think of as purely subjective, bunch of stories, just a bunch of narratives and myths and authority structures and power structures. And then people just kind of believing in this thing that doesn't have any actual uh, objective reality to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the DSM, we assume or we approach it as a objective tool toolbox and an objective Bible. Like it's a Bible where we go to, or the, you go to your priest, your therapist, and then they interpret you into Mm -hmm. this. We Mm -hmm. have all these modalities, but does it talk about you know, nature, man, and God, it does it have a narrative to it or kind of just, it it has to assume some sort of narrative that there's this objective world and human beings are this thing in the world. 
So there's got to be a story in there somewhere. But. Yeah, I think there are a lot of stories assumed in there about kind of what's normative and, mm. and what's um, what's not normative, what's healthy, what's not healthy. But you're you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the union analyst Jim Hollis calls uh, religions the great psychotherapeutic systems of the past. And one thing that the DSM doesn't have that you know a, a religion has is a kind of um, cosmology hmm. and, and explicit a sense. Yeah, well, but I'm sure but, it's there. Well, the, I, I think I think what I'm talking about though is a cosmology in sen- in the sense of um, the 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 belief in something transpersonal because. There's not much that's transpersonal in the DSM. Could you define what you mean by transpersonal? Well, something larger than the human ego. I mean, if there is something like that in the DSM, it, it maybe it's something like science. So science stands in for God. You or know? data for science. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, which is a pretty impoverished way of looking at it. But you know, I mean, mm. and listen, I'm 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 just a Jungian here. Not not every therapist is a Jungian. So there'd be plenty of therapists who wouldn't agree with what I'm about to say. But Jung said and I think he's pretty right about this that most people who are suffering from some kind of psychological distress are wrestling with issues of meaning. Mm. And and so having a sense of meaning uh you know, it helps helps bring about a sense of psychological well being. Or to rephrase that, perhaps recognizing that human beings are meaning makers, yeah, allows you to diagnose or give them tools to engage with how that meaning making is stuck or broken or mm-hmm. running them into dark places, mm-hmm. rather than you are a disordered or an ordered person and we're going to recognize your disorder and then we're going to give you tools to become an ordered person right 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 yeah i like is that that. is that where the dynamic and psychodynamic comes from (sighs) i'm not exactly sure i think uh psychodynamic uh is basically a more palatable way of saying psychoanalytically oriented Okay. But I suppose the dynamic means that there's something that's kind of on the move between the conscious and the unconscious. Okay. And you said that, um, or, or you intimated that there's nothing transpersonal, that the human being is kind of just basically an ego? Well, I'm, to the I'm DSM, talking, or? yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, according to the DSM, there's there's no, there. yeah, there's really there's really no uh if if it's a kind of a bible then then where's the god you know the and and what's what's the thing we're striving for we're striving for sort of uh homeostasis or yeah being normal functioning yeah (laughs) yeah not you know trying to get rid of all our symptoms or something or sins yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so then gender arrives on the scene. And this is why I think gender is just so fascinating and so disruptive. It's just beautifully yes. disruptive and ter- it's terrifying too in its power. But it arrives into this system that mm-hmm. just assumes that everything's the ego. And then the system has to adapt to, okay, well, there's this gender thing, but we don't know what a man and a woman is. We just kind of assume. Now we have to figure out what is feminine, what is masculine. And it doesn't seem like the DSM has that rich mythological structure that we derive the articulation of masculine and feminine from which is what i think of gender is the yes i think that's that's really fascinating and i i I think you're you're yeah yeah it's like what happens when when gender arrives on a scene when there's only ego you know and we, we we don't have any deeper way to think about things um yeah i mean uh rich i i was gonna say you know that we need a rich, do we need a rich mythological structure to talk about gender? Maybe we do. We certainly don't need that to talk about sex because that's just material reality. Hmm. Um, but sex, but, the act or sex, the bodily no, sex, being? sex, the categories. Okay. Okay. 
um, which that's pretty straightforward. But yeah. uh, but but yeah. So let me let me think about that for a second. So so gender arrives in this very concretized world. Hmm. Very where, me mechanistic and process oriented. Yes, and where everything is sort of considered to be explicit. Hmm. So, in other words, there's not the capacity to think about things metaphorically. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I've, I've heard many people say this, and I've made the same observation, that I think that gender is so fascinating because it gives us another way to think about uh, the non-rational, mm. to think about that mm. which tr transcends materiality. Yeah. I mean, you used to you used to be able to think about that which transcends, like your material body, for example. You would you would talk about a soul. Yeah. And if you were, a, a, you know, a, a geek in the Middle Ages, you could argue about how many souls I don't know fit on the head of a pen, or maybe that was angels. Or, but you you could you could really think about okay, what is a soul, and what does it mean, and what can it do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the difference between my soul and my body? And and because we've kind of wiped out these concepts, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, of course, soul is not an empirical concept. I'm not I'm not necessarily um, championing that as as a as a kind of fact. But I do think it's been a useful metaphor, perhaps, for us to think about who we are beyond just our material body. Yeah. And that's why when people who believe in gender promulgate that belief system, they talk about my internal feeling of self. And this is actually embedded in law. So yes. gender is your internal, it's your soul. Basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's there in that Canadian documentary that, that um, profiled Zucker that was from, hmm. I don't know. It was it was a while ago. It was from like 2017, 2018. Toward the end of it, um, there's a there's a trans clinician, and the interviewers say, um, ask something about like how do you know what gender you are, and the trans clinician says, "I feel it way down deep where the music plays." Oh wow. Oh yeah. Mm hmm. Right. Well, I mean, okay, so. I half of me makes fun of that and half of me admires that or respects sure. that. Sure. You that get language. it. You yeah. like that's compelling. Yeah. You know, it's it's something poetic and it points beyond that just like you're just a clump of cells that's you know, 70% water and this much carbon and blah 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 blah. It's like no, there's something else to you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a and it's a gender. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it leads you or through the process, this is where it gets really scary is that then it becomes medicalized and the medicalization becomes a ritualistic path of yeah. concretizing into your body, your soul yes. and your will exactly. through a process of will. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're in this really interesting place and I'm, I'm so glad you took us here where there in some sense to me, we could not be here now if we had lost our if we hadn't lost our ability to think symbolically hmm. because in some sense um transition is about the kind of reassertion of metaphor but in a sort of um perverse form let's define what we mean by perverse because i would i would even say satanic which would be another word that i wouldn't want to use but there's something <laughs> there's something wrong about engraving your subjective reality onto your physical body and mm -hmm. then doing that to your children there's something okay, wrong sure about that. sure <laughs> i wouldn't argue with that i mean so another way to think about it is it's it's sort of the right impulse but it's the wrong ritual oh wow okay hmm the right, it's the right impulse to want to find that within ourselves, which goes beyond just um, our, our, our kind of basic materiality, the fact that we're so much 
hydrogen and so much oxygen and so much carbon. Well, and even our know? social reality is I am a worker. Right. right? Yes. I have to, yeah. I am a parent. Like it's right? been kind of desacralized. The, the regular life, normal life. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and so there's an impulse maybe arising in the culture. We might say it's kind of the activation of an archetype, if you want to talk that way. Yeah. That is kind of demanding that we uh, reinstate symbolic thinking through gender identity, that it's going to present itself to us and demand that we deal with it. But then... Uh, it's the wrong ritual. So there, it's the right impulse to want to kind of have a relationship with something that is non-rational, that is transcendent, but then it's the wrong ritual because then it gets, like you said, kind of inscribed in the body in a concrete way. And, and, and just frankly, like, like the whole thing is a concretization, I think, of this kind of psycho-spiritual exploration. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When we were talking about gender arriving into the DSM, I had a vision of the hermaphrodite, which is a cross between Hermes and, and Aphrodite. Aphrodite. And, and Hermes is a trickster, but he's also the messenger. Mm-hmm. And Aphrodite is just the mother of Eros, right? We know who right, Aphrodite is. Right. And they mm-hmm. arrive, they have this this child that arrives in this Apollonian world, this purely rational mm-hmm. world, and it just mm-hmm. wreaks havoc on that. Because there's no answers. When you get into this debate, like Matt Walsh, like, what is a woman? Like, well, it's this thing, it's this thing. But like, if you actually honestly engage with that question, you have to lead you down a garden path of meaning. There's this mm-hmm. rich mm-hmm. meaning. And that's why your work with um, your book on motherhood, mm-hmm. like was a gendered book. It was about the experience of being a mother, a woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a woman has a baby. That's the physical function of it. But there's all this wisdom and all this distress and all this anxiety and struggle and all these stories that have been passed, brought up and told over and over again that, that are really useful for women to think about what mm-hmm. it is to be a woman mm-hmm. rather than just defining what a woman is. It's like, well... Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- uh, thanks. Thanks for that. I, you know, it, it also makes me think of uh, um, the work of Ian McGilchrist. He, he's written The Master and His Emissary, and he's written a, a, a newer book recently called The Problem with Things. And hmm. he talks about the the way, the different ways that the that our brain hemispheres kind of relate to the world. And I'm 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 gonna kind of do a hatchet job on this because his his book uh, is huge oh it's huge huge. and it's complex and it's wonderful but um so i'm gonna i'm certainly gonna be horribly oversimplifying it right now but 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 basically that the um the left hemisphere really deals with that which is kind of concrete and explicit and has to do with categories and categorization and and the uh right hemisphere is more about sort of just embodied knowing uh, that which is implicit. So you think about, well, what is a woman? And you, you think almost there, if there's sort of too much left hemisphere, you can come up with all these clever things that kind of get confusing. Whereas if you say, if you ask the right hemisphere, well, what's a woman? It's like, well, we know what that is. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's just, it's not even worth discussing because it's just mm-hmm. incredibly obvious from a sort of, embodied sense but when we try to play language games with it and then that, that's very much the the kind of the realm of, of the left hemisphere but i uh I, I spoke about this on my channel a few days ago but i want to bring it up here i went to the grocery store early in the morning and my checkout person was a trans woman and the bag the bagging person was this girl this young girl probably 20 23 22 like really just prime of life like a woman in that age is just has this force field around Mm. her of femininity Mm. and it was it was really difficult for me to navigate that situation one because i had to like figure okay this is a trans person put them in this category but just to have that contrast between a male and my body was just this is a male with female addenda this is a female period and ellipsis right and it was just so powerfully you know i could never like rationalize out of that it was so it was just embodied right. it was like actor just, in a field 
your yes your your body knew all of that and it it you know your your uh, left brain could have come up with all kinds of clever things to to mm-hmm. say about it but it wouldn't erase just this kind of knowing well and and but i also have to be aware of that knowing because i have to treat women differently than i treat men because there's mm-hmm. all this uh, there's just all these other exchanges that I have to be very clear in my intention and 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 be not too direct with a man. I could be more direct, and there's there's mm-hmm. just a there's a different set of games. Yeah, that and might if you, lead into gender theory, but yeah. Well, Sorry. and I'll just say if you're if you're female, the different the different set of games can really matter from a safety perspective. Yes. And so, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what we're teaching kids about, you know, don't assume someone's gender. I'm thinking, don't teach my daughter that. Hmm. No, um, you know, I, w- women, women have, I mean, men and women need to know who's a man and who's a woman because it kind of helps the continuation of the species thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But from a woman's perspective, it is vital to know who the men are because that is where danger comes from. Yeah. And um, so, in order to be a gentleman in my relationship to women, I need to very clearly signal that I am safe. Yep. I, I'm sa- and continually signal that. And then yes. once she is certain of that, then we can have like fun or we can, we can mm-hmm. have like some sort of rapport on top of that. Mm-hmm. But I have to very clearly or, and subtly, mm-hmm. it's kind of a weird game. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's different. So, so can I tell you a little bit about Geta? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association has this problem that you and I, I think, just did a good job of laying out in that we're, we're, what we're really championing is just good therapy. But we're trying to make that available to people who are looking for therapists who are dealing with gender who are not going to have an agenda one way or the other, hmm. who are not going to try to steer people toward transition and who are not going to try to prevent them from expressing themselves or identifying however they want, mm-hmm. but are really going to kind of open up a space. Hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done is we've created a clinical guidance for therapists working with gender dysphoric youth. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful document, if I do say so myself. It's over 100 pages long. It includes just sort of basic information because one of the things that's happening is that therapists say, well, I don't know how to work with this population. You were talking before about gender therapy. And one of the things that happens is that um, therapists think, well, I don't know how to do that. So let me refer them to a gender therapist. But really, if you're a good clinician and you've had good training, you can do this because it's just like anything else. Hmm. And so our clinical guidance kind of lays that out and talks about here's how to do the assessment, here's some things to think about, and it includes several case examples. So we're about to publish this guidance, make it publicly available for for anyone, but hopefully for therapists. And uh, to do that, we're going to be introducing it with a uh, with a webinar on uh, December third. That's free. So anyone can come to the webinar. And, and the content of the webinar is going to be kind of just an overview of just, that? And yes, a exactly. Yeah. An overview of this um, clinical guidance. So what is your recommendation, pedestrian? Well, you're at a cocktail party. You meet up with a uh, therapist friend. They're like, oh, there's this flood of gender youth, and uh, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't even know what this gender thing is. How do you like begin to unravel or put into its place what this gender thing is like what are some of the tactics so wait a minute so i'm at a cocktail party and i run into a therapist yeah well how would you just uh in casual conversation say, therapists don't really go to the cocktail parties very much what do you guys okay. go bowling or parcheesi or something <laughs> no no we just sit at home and watch netflix <laughs> you guys are so introverted <laughs> huh. yeah okay okay All right. anyway no so, how would you how would you casually begin to talk about just relay this thing called gender you know just to say okay don't be afraid of it this is kind of what it is or this is just kind of how to start to think about it well i mean it, that's such an interesting hypothetical right because a certain number of therapists will be very committed to the idea that we have to affirm 
which is part of the problem and part of the reason why we created Geta. Okay. Is be because it's actually really difficult, according to the families that contact us. Yeah. It's actually really difficult to find therapists who will um, who will work with trans identified kids who won't just affirm. Okay. And and you know and I know you know this because you've talked to so many people, but you know some of these therapists will you know sort of say, would you rather have a live son or a dead daughter? You need to get your own therapy to get over your transphobia. Yeah. So it's really kind of undermining of, of these parents who might just want to kind of pump the brakes a little bit before yeah. their child goes sailing off toward um, drugs and surgeries. I get so mad at these people. Mm -hmm. I get so mad at them. But okay, so the job, what you're saying is that it's not about talking about gender. It's actually about unraveling what this affirmation model is. Like, why did they conclude that affirmation? What is affirmation? So it's a challenge, I guess, first and foremost, or principally in one respect of challenging affirmation or thinking about that, unraveling a little bit. Give me well, a so why my, our hypothetical therapist that I might meet at the hypothetical cocktail party may be either strongly affirmative and therefore will think I'm a turf yeah. and a bigot and probably will be very difficult to have that conversation, although I could tell you how I would start. Hmm. Then there might be someone who'd say, you know, I don't know. I don't know much about that. Uh, I, I really just try to steer clear of it. And then there's the third category who it's like, oh my God, I'm so glad you said something. <laughs> yeah. Which hopefully is the so, growing category. I hope that's the growing category. And that's certainly the people that we're trying to uh, welcome to Geta. You know, Geta has um, a kind of private component where members that, who are all therapists can uh share resources you know i need a i need someone to see this patient in you know florida or does anyone know of a psychiatrist in new orleans or that kind of thing it's international though by the way we have members in australia and canada and the uk so mm -hmm. um and and there's also a public facing directory that therapists can opt into so get a members don't have to put their name on the directory many don't but it's a growing directory too. So when someone calls me or e emails me and says, help, you know, do you have a therapist? I say, go to the get a directory. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, it's a growing bank of, uh, of therapists who are just being a little bit more thoughtful about this. This is, this so, is fun. Because we're moving is, from theory or from metaphor and symbology and psychoanalysis into politics, which is about power oh, and the, and the okay. game of like you, you your you, psychology or therapy is at war on this. This is a war game. You have very powerful interest groups and a growing little resistance, right? So you have to navigate and, and this that's that's and they all have to navigate this. They're either, yeah. you're either silent and you let it happen. You affirm and you do it or you start to question it and then you put yourself on the line because you can get your license revoked. You can get harassment threats. So it's a high risk situation for the rebels. Yeah. You know, I, um, I know that people are afraid of getting their license revoked and I can understand that fear and that fear is really chilling, but I don't know of a single person who's lost their license because they've been doing, they've been working in an exploratory way. And I think it hmm. would, I don't think it's going to happen, but certainly the fear of it or the fear that you might even have to, um, you know, uh, deal with a challenge to your license is, is really quite chilling. Um, I think that it's, it is frightening. People feel like they're going to get ostracized from their professional societies. People feel like they may uh, lose their practices because people won't come to them. Uh, so there are, are real things on the line. And certainly if you work in a group practice or you're working under someone and you, you need them to sign off on your hours or whatever, your hands are really tied. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say I would say that you're characterizing it as a resistance is is accurate and oh, okay. I, I suppose that's uh, that's fitting. I've always been sort of fascinated with the partisans. What, what, what do you mean? 
The resistance movement in World War II, the Party Johnny in Italy. In Italy, I have. I, oh, yeah. I, I'm mm-hmm. catching up on World War II. I have not got to the Italy yeah. part of it. I'm yeah. still stuck in Germany. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, cool, how? Cool so there's those three three hypothetical uh, cocktail conversations. Yes. One is affirmative, which is going to be difficult. The other is yeah. But uh, if you want, I'll, I'll play that game. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's let's see how you go through those. Okay. Okay. So let's see. I've I've actually been in this situation before. I might say something like, um, you know, there really isn't good evidence base to indicate that these interventions help people. And I could wonk out on that a little bit, depending on which way the conversation went. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's the suicide thing or okay, you know, yeah. The Dutch protocol or whatever, but you know, the evidence, the evidence base is just not there. Yeah. And I worry that we don't have a good way of knowing who's going to be helped by these interventions and who won't be helped by them or who might even be harmed. And then I might throw in, and you know, there's a growing population of detransitioners and I've worked with some detransitioners clinically mm-hmm. and there's just kind of room. There's just things that make me pause here. Okay. That's how I might start. But uh, evidence of absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. So the lack of evidence isn't really a strong counter. So you have to kind I of point disagree. to. I disagree. I no? disagree. I disagree because I think that um, when you're talking about uh, engaging in a really. Um, you know, you know, an, an intervention that's that's going to result in harm to the body. You need to, you better have some good evidence. You know, it's like that um, aphorism: extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Okay. Well, extraordinary interventions should require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. So I don't know. You you, you want to give me? You want to give me? I don't know what. I don't know, Prozac for my depression. I mean, I personally think that that's not inconsequential either, mm-hmm. but, but Prozac probably isn't going to result in, you know, loss of function of significant organs. Mm-hmm. It's not going to sterilize a kid. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, so if, if you want to play around with something like that without good evidence, mm. oh, okay, I get it. I get it. Like, let's do something rather than nothing, but you're going to start talking about um, permanently messing up a kid's endocrine system, yeah. perhaps compromising sexual function, fertility. No, you need really good evidence for that. You know, the thing is, you know, we do terrible things to kids, like we sterilize them or cut off limbs or that kind of thing. When they have cancer, that will kill them if we don't do it. And as far as I know, and I'm certainly not an oncologist, but before we say cut off a kid's leg or 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 give them you know terrible drugs we're 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 pretty sure that death is the other option and that is not at all true here in spite Hmm. of what they say oh god i just can't believe it's gone so far so i just if somebody's so far that they haven't really weighed that it it just seems like the the first do no harm principle has been lost at some point or yeah. has been perverted into I have to do this because to not do this is harm. That's 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 how I think these people are thinking. Okay. I mean, I I've said this before and I'll stick by it. I think most therapists who are pro affirmation really really believe they're doing the right thing. These are not evil people. But yes, that's exactly right. They're thinking doing harm is not doing anything. Mm-hmm. But we we only started doing this what 20 years ago, if that. Mm-hmm. So where where were all these kids 25 years ago? Like, why all of a sudden do we have to rush people off to endocrinology when they're unhappy in puberty? And and it's also kind of getting back to <laughs> my war wars today. It's like it's so unpsychological. We don't we don't treat any other okay. mental health disorder. You know. Anytime you treat a mental health disorder with surgery, it should really make you pause. Is there another 
therapy to surgery pipeline. Um, well, there used to be lobotomy. Lobotomies and then the electroshock therapy, which is still kind of in use. It shows results from yeah. what I've heard. Yeah. But that, the lobotomy itself is pretty insane. <laughs> like, there's uh, yeah. you're jabbing a needle into your brain and swirling it around. Like, <laughs> 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 and And the guy who invented it won the Nobel Prize. For that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Oh, man. What do you, uh, this is off topic, but what do you think about, uh, what, what's it called? Like expertiseism or, or like, like there's this professionalism, this like Nobel Prize winning person, credentialism. It just seems like it's such an eminently corruptible system that we can't do it without, yeah. but it's just so yeah. corruptible. Yeah. It is corruptible. That's a good point. Yeah. How do you know? Do you have any thoughts on that? When you think like sociologically and politically on this issue, like, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I guess I've thought some about how how practically I would steer clear of that because I think I think that's one of the things about gender, right? Is you realize how susceptible we all are. We are all susceptible to kind of going off the rails. You know, that, that sort of like was a, a wake up call for me. It's like, oh, so how do you avoid kind of um, hmm. going, going off the cliff with the experts? Because sometimes ex like experts often don't go off the cliff. I mean, experts don't often go off the cliff, right? It's often good to follow the experts, but sometimes it's really, really bad to follow the experts. Mm -hmm. So how do you know when? Mm -hmm. And I want to say some, there is some, there is some role for just kind of your gut. Hmm. It's almost like you can't, you can't just trust your gut. That's a bad idea. You can't just trust experts. That's a bad idea. You can't just trust research that can lead you astray. Mm. Um, you can't just trust majority opinion, but if you, if you sort of take all of those on board, your gut instinct, what the experts say, what the research says, what um, lived experience of other people, you kind of anec the anecdotal level, mm -hmm. uh, what, what everyone else seems to be doing. If you kind of, if you sort of look at all of those, um, mm. you know, you're likely to sort of start to get a clearer picture. Yeah. Well, and you, patience, or you take out the urgency. Yes, yeah, and patience. Quotient. Exactly. Yes. I mean, that certainly was my process. It well, didn't feel right to me yeah. right from the beginning. It didn't feel right. I think we've covered but, this, but it's been a few years. When was that that you first? It, 2016. Uh, and was it, what was it that? It was kind of coming into my practice. Um, people had kind of kids doing it or friends' kids doing it. And then, you know, I, I live in a very... Um, a very like liberal progressive neighborhood and a liberal progressive city. And so a lot of my uh, kids friends were kind of starting to experiment with this. It was, you know, kind of sweeping like wildfire through their friend groups. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And, and I, I thought it was just all kind of groovy hmm. until I realized that it was being medicalized. And then I thought, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find any data. I couldn't find any research. I couldn't find any experts, really, who were saying anything cautionary about it, except for what I found on Fourth Wave Now. Denise. Mm -hmm. Denise, yes. Bad mama. So that was like, yeah, <laughs> she is. So I was like, okay, so I'm, you know, so, but I had to, but I had to, I spent months like reading and talking to people and digging into the research and, you know, talking to trans people and talking to scientists and talking to detransitioners and really just trying to kind of look at the whole elephant and see, you yeah, know? Yeah. It, it's definitely uh, that you had to do all that work and the medical industry had already accepted it. It's like, wait, 
who's catching up to who? It, it seems like completely reverse uh, standards of care that yeah. you'd expect from yeah. <laughs> things. So again, but again, I, I mean, I mean, I may have told you this before, <laughs> but I had this moment where I, I remember where I was. I remember, you know, I was reading, I think, some psychotherapy journal that was that was talking about how how important it was to affirm and how mm -hmm. great it was that we were doing this. And and I thought to myself, you know, I guess I just don't understand this. I guess that that this is just beyond my ability to comprehend it clearly that you know and then a little voice said that's not true you've seen this before you saw this in the 90s with um, dissociative identity disorder and satanic ritual abuse it's just happening again hmm. and i was like oh yeah And, and I, you know, I mean, I know you and I have talked about this before, but psychotherapy is very uh, susceptible to these sort of what I have come to think of as these kinds of iatrogenic contagions. Iatrogenic. Iatro iatrogenic means that the harm is caused by the cure. Mm. And not so in like a, a radiotherapy way. I mean, I guess radiotherapy would be one example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you, um, not that you have time, but did you see my interview with Eliza Mondegreen? Oh, yes, I did. Yes. <laughs> so that DSD or DID thing is coming back in a big way and they can't fend it off. Like the, these, uh, professional organizations have made themselves entirely susceptible to madness or mass psychosis and 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 now as you pointed out earlier today we've got the internet like it's just gonna sort of supercharge all of this stuff yeah, i mean yeah. the did stuff has been um kind of on its way back for a while i think it started well it definitely started on tumblr the source of all evil <laughs> At least but from the young are, girl quarter. Of yeah, yeah, all. yeah, yeah. Let's see. Back in like 2015, 2016, oh, that, like I remember. The other kin thing. Well, but yeah. even just like, you know, 12 year old girls talking about their headmates. Well, I mean, I guess there was imaginary friends, but that was never like included in the diagnostic journal of medicine. Was there? No. I, is there a lot of no, research no, in there? No, 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 no. Friends? That's, okay. it's, that's considered entirely like normal and, and, you know, yes, but, but, uh, right. So these, you know, 12 year old girls talking about headmates and, um, and then, and then of course it's gotten another big boost with TikTok. You know, there's a whole DID thing on TikTok. You probably yeah. know that. They have so, yes. voices. It's a bunch of theater kids basically that are, uh, <laughs> incredibly isolated and projecting themselves on the internet rather than just forming a little polycule in high school. And like getting sweaty together and practicing all their moves and then going out in the world, they're, they're all separated, isolated, and sending themselves messages, millions. And, and the thing is that all of this stuff that we're talking about, it, it kind of goes back to, the, to what I was talking about before. It's like the right impulse. That's mm. like an incredibly creative thing to do is almost yeah. sort of world build, yeah. you know? But it's the wrong ritual and it's being concretized. And mm -hmm. then you're writing yourself a story. You're, you're in creating a narrative for yourself in conjunction with social media and your friends and, you know, the mm -hmm. psychiatric literature. And you're creating a narrative that may help you, but could trap you in a bad place. Mm -hmm. And when the therapists are affirming you in that they're not being therapists. You know, one of the things that's interesting about um, D the DID stuff is back when that was the social contagion and everyone was, you know, it was in the media and it was in books and it was on Geraldo was or whatever. Movie. There were movies, everything, yeah. um, trainings for therapists, you know, yeah. Um, it was very exciting. If you were a therapist, you wanted to have a dissociative identity patient. Um, I mean, of, talk about world building. Yeah. Like, imagine all the therapy Seriously. you get to do. Right. 
Right. And it's like, and it's, and it's like fascinating and, you know, you could write your book about it or whatever. Mm. Um, but uh, I, w- I was going to say that it, patients that exhibited those kinds of symptoms, but were not given the diagnosis, were less likely to have a completed suicide than patients who exhibited those symptoms and were given the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And that is frightening because yeah. it, it shows how, how these stories, you know, I mean, a diagnosis is basically a narrative. This is how it starts. This is how it goes on. And this is how it's likely to end. Mm-hmm. And if you take on a certain narrative, like, oh, I have dissociative identity disorder, one of the ways that ends is I kill myself, then it can become its own, I don't want to say self-fulfilling prophecy, because that's not exactly right. But, you know, we're, we're, we're all influenced by our sto- the stories that we believe about ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I, I really worry about this with the trans kid thing, because I feel like one of the things these kids hear all the time is, being suicidal goes along with being trans. These kids are hearing, if you're trans, part of that is being suicidal. And they're hearing that, unfortunately, on social media, in the mainstream media, they're sometimes hearing it from their therapists, or mm-hmm. doctors, they're when hearing it teachers, from friends, counselors. they're hearing it from people in positions of authority. And, and, I, and, and we know that suicide is actually quite susceptible to peer and media influence, especially among adolescents, Mm. which is why there are rules for journalists about how they are supposed to talk about suicide. It's, it's um, Hmm. why we see these horrible suicide clusters, because there's influence involved. So if you're telling a group that already has fragile mental health that may be vulnerable for for various reasons and then you tell them oh yes and one of the ways that your distress will manifest is you will become suicidal i really worry that we're generating more suicidality in that population Mm -hmm. there's got to be a greek myth this is some sort of uh some sort of oedipal prophecy that shouldn't have happened and then self-fulfills itself Right. Mm-hmm. From a, from some I'll story. have to think about that. There's, there's one guy I think uh, in in the Oedipus story, like he was cursed to give a prophecy or something like that. I can't remember, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm also I'm curious about. Um, so we're talking about the kids' narrative, or the person with gender dysphoria, or just psychological health uh, related to narrative. And that the therapist, the therapist's job is to facilitate um, dynamically somebody becoming aware of the stories and choosing the right story or like using shape, using narrative in a, in a constructive, positive way in order to build a good life. That's the personal level. But when you're talking about a family, like a mother and a father or a mother or a father and a kid and the, that the, the narrative, especially with the child, because the child comes from you, your narrative includes them somehow, and then it doesn't include them at a certain point. And there's this whole process of, of negotiating that narrative world building together. And, Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to a child in distress, like part of the job, or maybe the parents need to also have their own therapy. Right. And, in order to figure out how to navigate this thing. How does that, because you've done a lot of work with the parents, what are some of the helpful anecdotes or tools or stories you've been able to, to give to parents that are struggling with children mm-hmm. going through this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, I think it, it depends so much on the situation. It depends on the age of the kid. It depends on the family. There's many different uh, kinds of constellations that I've seen. One of them is um, that the kid really needs to separate from from the mom. I mean, usually, and usually it's the mom. It's not always the mom, but let's just say mom. Hmm. You know, um, we're in this age where and if you're part of a certain kind of uh, subculture, we're parenting very intensively. 
I mean, you know, a lot of women kind of in my cohort, I mean, our children are our lives and we, you know, when we were raising them, we thought about them all the time. We thought about every single thing. We made very careful choices about their clothing. We made very careful choices about their toys and about their uh, food. And, Mm. you know, we, I made my own baby food for Christ's sake. You know what I mean? And it's like, and you, and you, you just kind of, it's like their whole lives are really curated because you want to do the very best thing by them. And, uh, you know, as they, as they get older, there's a lot of kind of investing in, um the music lessons or the sports or whatever it is and and it's it's interesting that um family estrangement is on the rise along with this really kind of intensive parenting Hmm. and i and i i wonder if part of what's happening is these kids so desperately need to differentiate themselves from mom and I, I, I really, I really feel for my daughter because, you know, especially mother daughters, right? I, I just sort of decided at one point that it's totally normal for mothers and daughters <laughs> to be enmeshed. It's like inevitable, you know, it's like my daughter always, I was always kind of worried about what she, what she was thinking and feeling. And she was always kind of very attuned to what I was thinking and feeling. And it was like, oh my God, we just need to get away from each other. Hmm. Um, Hmm. And, and, and I think that uh, some of these families that I've seen, these are very loving, attached mothers, um, you know, not, not pushovers, they're sophisticated people, they're educated, um, but they are very, very attached to the kid. And the kid is very attached to the parent. And it seems to me that um, at a certain stage, adopting a trans identity does this incredible thing where it um, Hmm. helps you differentiate. It's like, I'm so much not like you, mom, that I'm not even female. At the same time that the kid kind of usually becomes a little more vulnerable, their mental health gets a little bit worse. And so all of a sudden, They've differentiated, but mom has also drawn closer because mom is now really kind of hovering around being like, are you okay? Are you okay? What do you need? we got to get you to the therapist. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. So yeah. it's it sort of, it sort of like gets, it gets you closer to mom at the same time that you're trying to differentiate. Like it does this wonderful thing. You don't really have to step away from mom and do some of the scary things that we do when we're separating, like maybe you know, kind of establish ourselves as, you know, mom, mom was always a runner and now I'm going to be a musician or something like that. Or, um, you know, I know you probably heard all this, like kids, they're not getting their driver's license. They don't want their driver's licenses, you know? And, and it's like these, these things, cause it's scary. So to go out in the world and differentiate from mom a little bit is frightening. If you say you're trans, you get to have the benefit of the psychological separation without having to do any of the kind of developmental growth. But it, it simulates that journey, but it's still very cosmetic, very like, I'm going to choose clothes. Now I'm going to choose a different name. Now I'm Mm going to, so it's not really like going out in the world and learning a skill thing. It's still, it traps the Mm -hmm. kid thinking about themselves even more. Yes. Yes. And I think you brought up a really good point that I wanted to tie to a kind of a question that occurs sometimes about the populations of youth that become trans. And it is a class issue. And I think it, it's, it's a class issue because you're looking at the children of professional, probably professional, well, just demographically speaking, professional uh, women who uh, are... Uh, kind of the liberal feminist, the child was a choice, right? The, the internalization mm-hmm. of being mm-hmm. pro-choice. It's like, okay, I chose this child. So now I have to choose mm-hmm. everything about the child. So the relationship yeah. between the mother psychologically and this product of her body is enforced by a political narrative um, as well. And then the affluent aspect of that um, kind of goes hand in hand. But there's also a lot, I, I say that, that's one population, but there's a lot of... Uh, females who adopt the trans identity because of being poor and abused and and there's a lot of other yeah issues going and, on 
And absolutely. And, and, and uh, I am so aware of the sort of selection bias in this area because the parents who contact me or that mm. I, you know, reach out to me are, are, are sort of a self-selected group who are going to be reading online and, you know, reading, reading my papers in peer reviewed journals and then, you know, contacting me and that sort of thing. So it's, I, I actually have no idea, really no good idea of what this looks like in other socioeconomic brackets. Yeah, yeah. The people that, that find me are, are mostly, um, uh, let's just say, you know, quite educated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, the, which makes sense when you're answering what my question was, what are some of the tools that you give to parents that you're working with in this? And mm -hmm. one is, so what is what, what do you say to a mom like that? Like, back off, bitch. I'm, I'm <laughs> Like, kind of yeah. yeah i mean and it depends on where you know where how old the kid is and stuff like that yeah. but i mean just trying to kind of maybe bring some consciousness to the the dynamic and and mm -hmm. not in a not in a kind of blaming or shaming way i mean like i said i think it's really it's really normal to feel mm -hmm. i i remember um uh one of the things that happened with my own daughter is um, she went she went away for two months. She went she had an experience abroad for two months when she was thirteen. Oh, and when she was gone, you know, we we there had been a lot of conflict before she left and stuff. And when she was gone, it was kind of like a good reset for me. And I I was I became aware when she was gone. I was reflecting, and I I became aware that. I had been in the habit of 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 just sort of talking about things in my life with her in a kind of casual way. I mean, not super personal things, but like, oh, you know, so and so, you know, canceled our lunch date on Friday, and I'm irritated or something like that, you know, or or you know, oh, I just found out I blah 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 blah, and and. And I, I realized in hindsight that she did not like that at all. And I, you know, in, in, when I thought about it when she was gone, I realized that she would get kind of irritable whenever I would say anything like that. Hmm. And it was such a, it was such a reversal because when she was a small child, like many small child, many small child, many small children, she was really interested in in any and everything. That I had to say, and she would always, you know, listen to my private conversations, and she'd mm. want to know what I was talking about. And so I had just sort of fallen into, um, you know, just just being a little bit too casual with talking about again, not super personal things, mm. but just things that might be going on for me. And I was like, oh, she doesn't want that anymore. Um, so when she came back, I never did that again. And, and uh, I could, I could see that she appreciated that. So, so I just, I, I just think that, that there's this whole okay, piece of yeah. work around parenting an adolescent female that mothers need to do. And changing the relationship pattern. Yes, yes. And, and recognizing that we, we really need to withdraw from the space somewhat because we loom very large for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we need to, we need to withdraw a little bit and and let them have center stage. Yeah, yeah. And so does it, I mean, that's one possible configuration. Do they come yeah. back to you after that? Like when they're 23, 24? Like I don't know. Friends again? Check in with to, me in a couple of years and okay. I'll let you know. Just have to just let it go. I mean, I think it's a long process, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. Feeling well, like you're... Again, patience is key. Yeah. And what are some of the patterns with the fathers that you've seen? Fathers' relationships to sons, fathers' relationships mm -hmm. to daughters that, that you've seen. Many fathers are really quite passive. They can take a, they can, I'm, I'm just thinking with, well, with either the daughters or the sons, but I'm right now I'm thinking more of the daughters. They, they can kind of take this, um, this view that uh, this isn't a big deal. It's just a phase. The kid's going to come out of it. Mom's freaking out and is spending 10 hours a day researching gender online. And dad's like, you know, you don't, 
this is no big deal. You're overreacting. I've seen that. Or I've seen dads just have an almost kind of like fatalistic attitude. Like, well, there's really nothing we can do, which sometimes is true. Mm. And that's, that can be a very adaptive stance. Actually. It's like, well, the kids, you know, kids 21 kids going to do what he's going to do. So, you know, let let me, let me not worry about it too much. Cause like, what am I going to do? But, but that can feel very abandoning to the mom. If the mom is very upset. Mm Mm-hmm. So the the dad's got to interact with the mom and the daughter. And I mm-hmm. are you are you suggesting that there's a way for the father or there's a a pattern of uh relationship between father and daughter that needs to also change when the daughter becomes a teenager and the the dad needs to uh form a, a different kinds of connection or be more involved in a certain way. I mean, again, I I don't know that there's kind of a formula here, but I do uh, think that when there's a strong dad on the scene, that that can be helpful, partly because it's like another pole. You know, if you think about it, the daughter has to um, differentiate herself from her mom. And if dad is there in a positive, strong way, she has the other pole to go to. She can go kind of be with dad. And that, that could be a way of like staying connected with the family, but not having to be so close to mom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and like being close to mom feels icky because it feels like you're just going to bleed right into each other. Hmm. Or, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the female uh, typical psychology is so just so fuzzy and blurry and, and it yeah, kind of absorbs yes. and, and resonates. Euroboric. Like, yeah. Euroboric. Yeah, kind of devouring. Huh. Yeah, like just going, just it has a tendency to feel like it's just going to bleed back into this undifferentiated masa confusa. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. That that has a politi- that has political ramifications too. Um but mm-hmm. that's a whole other conversation. What yes. in in the union sphere how is your professional organizations or how have thinkers in your uh realm of analysis um been approaching the gender issue is there has there been conferences and stuff about this or you're on the cutting edge of this have they thought about it brought it up question no i don't i mean i don't think that Jungians per se organizationally are thinking about it okay i think there are individual Jungians who are thinking about it and and actually i i feel a sense of pride in saying that many Jungians have been out front and saying wait a minute we need to think about this and i think it's because of what i was saying before that some of this is happening because we we're not thinking symbolically and that's that's kind of our stock and trade when i first became aware of this in 2016 one of the first things i did was read an article by robert withers who is a, a uk Jungian analyst and he had, he wrote up a case um, about uh, referencing a detransitioner that he that he'd worked with, and um, and then I contacted him and he talked to me, you know, um, and I remember him saying at the time, "This is a mass psychosis." Hmm. And and anyway, and there have been uh, several other union colleagues since who have been very involved. I, I feel pretty safe talking about this with unions because for the most part they get it. But, you know, I was at our international conference in Vienna in 2019, and some of the presentations were very shallow on this topic, Hmm. very, you know, sort of, you know, almost like gender unicorn level stuff. It was kind of depressing. That is depressing for unions specifically. Yeah. And there, and, and there are certainly, there are some there are some Jungian scholars out there who have really taken issue with my writings and hmm. are very upset with me, I would say. Oh. So mm-hmm. what happens when Jungians fight? Do you guys draw pictures of each other and burn them in fields <laughs> or something? <laughs> Actually we're we're um we're infamous for having schisms 
and uh, there's there's hardly an ins a Jungian institute that hasn't gone through a schism. Huh. So huh. we we don't we're we're not actually that that good at holding the tension of the opposites when it when oh, comes to show. Yeah, probably. But most of my yeah. most of my colleagues have been really lovely and supportive, and I'm always kind of banging on about this, and most of the time they're they're really really pretty supportive. From the Jungian point of view, what is a mass psychosis? What are the aspects of that? And have you read much literature uh, from the Jungian? Well, Jung called it psych a psychic epidemic. And he did write a fair amount about psychic epidemics. And he, he felt that it was uh, an aspect of mass psychology. He was very distrustful of mass psychology, which I understand because when he lived, you know, he lived through World War One. he lived through World War Two. he was right there in the middle of Europe and Switzerland. And he saw that like mass psychology does some really bad shit. Um, he was he he felt like when people in a in a mass kind of get carried away by these archetypal forces and that the lowering there's a kind of lowering of consciousness that's very bad mm. and that we're actually very susceptible to this. He says this a bunch mm. of different times in a bunch of different ways that you know the the thing that that is most likely to endanger us is uh, a psychic epidemic that it's not going to be if you know a flood or a disease or anything like that it's going to be these these psychic epidemics um uh so hmm. yeah i mean i i could i could go on i well, suppose the the lowering of consciousness on a social level because I, I just been thinking uh i'm just thinking of the, like the last five years of watching what happened in evergreen watching what happened in 2020 uh not just with the pandemic on the professional sphere, but the Black Lives Matter riots on, on a sphere. It was very like lockstep, shout, destroy, enforce, do the thing, obey, right? It was not, the, the nuance factor was just like collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's just societies just kind of go through shocks like that and then people wake up on the other end. I wonder if there's any way to slow it down or f give friction to it like hold on hold on hold the line hold the line i was wondering did y jung ever talk about like the yeah. individual's responsibility yes. to stop society yes. from self yes yes someone asked him once if um he thought that hum hum humanity would survive the nuclear era and he said you know he wasn't particularly optimistic yeah. but what he said was it all depends on how many people do the work of uh kind of integrating their shadow yeah so you know the part that is optimistic about it is he basically said if we all do our own psychological work if if i go off and you know, do my journaling and reflecting and talk to my analyst, um, I am adding just a tiny drop more of consciousness to the kind of human enterprise. Okay. And if, if we all do that as much as we can, that that could make a difference. So, you know, if, if you think about it, it's, he's recommending this development of the individual consciousness as opposed to just collapsing into a kind of mass movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He also said that in order to kind of maintain a sense of individuality in the face of mass movements, and he was really writing this kind of as the Cold War was really, you know, kind of ginning up, that what we needed was um, a, a, a kind of personal experience of the transpersonal and he, he was not talking about dogmatic religions but a set some sense of you know what that great good thing is in the hmm. universe that makes the trees blossom in the springtime there's this excellent um I cannot think of his name. I'll put it in on the screen. Um, this talk, it was on Tucker Carlson's podcast with uh, this guy who wrote about mass formation psychosis. Mm, and mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating stuff. And he uh, is very, very, very smart guy. And towards the end of the episode, he speaks about going from being an atheist and a rationalist and just following that all the way to the end. And he said that every scientist, every like, you know, 
almost every like top tier scientist gets to a point where they realize that rationality is a very, very small tool and that yeah. merging with reality is a completely greater uh, experience. And without that, if we build society around rationality and we try to build, build solutions to society around rationality, it, it's, it, it's always going to collapse because we're not. Yeah. Cause it, it, it can't handle everything we need it to handle. Yeah. Um, can I read you one of my favorite quotes from Young that oh, yeah. I think addresses this? I forgot. You're a quoter. Oh, I love quotes. I love yeah. quotes. This is a good one. Uh, we think we can congratulate ourselves on having already reached such a pinnacle of clarity, imagining that we have left all these phantasmal gods far behind. But what we have left behind are only the verbal specters, not the psychic facts that were responsible for the birth of the gods. We are still as much possessed today by autonomous psychic contents as if they were Olympians. Today, they are called phobias, obsessions, and so forth. In a word, neurotic symptoms. The gods have become diseases. <laughs> Zeus no longer rules Olympus, but rather the solar plexus and produces curious specimens for the doctor's consulting room or disorders the brains of politicians and journalists who unwittingly let loose psychic epidemics on the world. Collected Works, Volume 13, Paragraph 54. And so to, to wrap up, what is, the, <laughs> uh, what is the proper response to reawakening one's relationship with those autonomous psychic forces that used to be called the gods? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, that's a really big question. Yeah. You know, think this because, is the ending question. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what I'll say is, um, hmm, yeah, okay, let's go back to the cocktail party. Um, no, what, the, the thing is that, you know, what Jung called the religious function of the psyche, which basically means our inborn sort of hardwired uh, predisposition to seek meaning and a relationship with the transcendent, it can be incredibly healthy and it can help us have a sense of meaning and purpose and it can help us kind of stay connected with ourselves and the instincts. Mm -hmm. uh, it can help us uh, foster generosity and awe and resilience and love. And it can also lead us into, um, you know, dogmatic thinking and uh, paranoia and um, judgmentalism and, and witch hunts. Uh, sorry, and witch hunts and witch hunts yeah. and um, and myopia. You know, so I I don't know that I've quite figured but that out <laughs> that process is going to be working no matter what yes that is what Jung says and i think he's right so if you are carve out a space in your life to do that process intentionally however it suits you you're going to be better off to be able to control that or be aware of how that process is always going to be working in you and everybody around you mm -hmm. i have another quote can i read you another quote please read Ugh. Um, I can't, I can't find it, oh. but it's, um, it's um, David Foster Wallace, mm. the novelist who wrote Infinite Jest. He says, I can sort of recall it. He says, you can't not worship. Yeah. Everybody worships and you're better off worshiping something like Allah or Buddha or, you know, somebody like that, because most of the other things that you worship will eat you alive. Hmm. So I think that's just, you, you, you said it really beautifully a minute ago, and that's just another way of saying the same thing. I'm going to guess that that that's from be Let This Be Water or This Is Water, his uh, yeah. commencement yeah, yeah. speech, I believe. Mm -hmm. That is, it is in that, yes. Lisa, you always bring the meaning. <laughs> it's always fun to talk with you. So uh, yeah. let's let's plug uh, Geta one more time. You guys are having mm -hmm. a conference. It's free for all. 
There'll on be a December, webinar on webinar, December 3rd. December 3rd. Yes, yeah. to introduce our clinical guidance. If you're a therapist, if you know a therapist, if you want to send your therapist, if you want to just come because you like hanging out with therapists, even though we're terrible <laughs> at cocktail parties. <laughs> and Parcheesi, apparently. <laughs> but you're great at pontificating over the internet. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Books. Is that what I did for the No, past, no, not you. I'm just saying you pontificate? guys come up with these guidelines and then you're like, we have the, you come up with your tablets no, like we have no tablets. yes yes oh, these are the stone tablets no I'm just kidding. um but yeah um uh, maybe you can put a link so that people can you can get a ticket um and then we'll send you out the uh link that day and uh, this union life you guys uh still uh is that active oh, yeah. you guys still yep we're still we're still um yep we still are popping out the episodes this union life and which is a podcast yeah. where you guys discuss topics through a Jungian lens and then you read dream interpretations from mm -hmm. the audience at the end. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a great show. That's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's that.